Good morning. Good morning. A beautiful morning. I have a, a couple of Ask the Pastor questions that I want to address today. You guys hear like my voice behind me? This is really weird. I'm getting something. Wow, okay. I'll move over here. That's weird. Okay, so the first one I have, uh, the question is, are only the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit outside of created time? Uh, is Satan or the demons? That's an excellent question. We've got to go to physics. Because time only exists where there's matter. Okay? Physics tells us that, that there are four sources. There's time, there's energy, there's matter, and there's one other. I can't remember what it is. I'm not a phys physicist, nor a physician. <laughs> I am physical, though. <laughs> so, um, as such, without matter, there is no time. We know that God transcends time. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He exists outside of time, but He is able to work within time. Um, I heard it described one time like this. It's as if all of time were happening inside a globe all at the same time, and God was on the outside watching all of it. I like that idea because He sees all of it. I don't like that idea because it makes it sound like God's removed. He's not removed. As a matter of fact, from the beginning... Whose beginning? Our beginning. From the beginning of mankind, God has been involved in everything that's been going on. So, do the angels and the demons exist outside of time? Mostly yes. They do exist in that they're immortal. But then again, so are we. Because we have a spirit and a soul, and one day we will have a new body... And so we will live, live for all time from the moment of conception on. Okay? So in that regard, yes, we exist outside of time. Satan exists outside of time. In that time does not have a hold on us. However, only God transcends time. Only God is capable of seeing all things going on at one time. And, and at this very moment, God is seeing what I'm saying here right now. And seeing what I saw last year on this day. And seeing what I will say next year on this day. Only God does that. So, let me look see if there was anything else in here. Um, I'll leave it at that. So I will leave this up here. There's some scripture references in there for you to take a look at. Uh, the next question that I have is actually a two-pager. <laughs> I'll read the questions first. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. So that the series of questions that come is, Is he saying this to all believers or just those who are doubting Paul? Is it possible to make a profession of faith in Christ and not be in it? Can I drift away from it? How? When it says to test yourself, do I test myself by seeing if Jesus Christ is in me? What does that look like? What does it look like if I fail to meet the test? If I fail, what do I do? How often should I do this? That's page one. <laughs> Page two is very similar. It's actually two separate pages that I put together because they're asking essentially the same thing. If I make a profession of faith and then fall away, am I backsliding? What happens if I die while in this state? I'm going to answer who was this written to. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. 
So who is this written to? Specifically in the moment, it's written to the Corinthian church. However, however, we believe that all scripture is God-breathed. And so, by the fact that it is divinely inspired, it's spoken to us. Okay? So, specifically, it was written to the church in Corinth. Paul was looking at a particular event, a particular need that was going on. But God, who sees beyond that because he transcends time, knew that we were going to need this at this point in the future. <coughs> <coughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. <coughs> so can we drift away? Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of answer this backwards. <coughs> <clears throat> because there's two things going on here. One, there's an issue of faith, salvation. Are you saved? And can you go from being saved to not being saved? And two, holding fast to the teaching that we, they, have received. Okay, so there's, there's two things that are being dealt with here. Um, the first thing is, can we drift away? I think the better question is that what is the writer cautioning them to not drift away from? I believe they are being cautioned to not drift away from sound teaching. Not from the faith. Scripture tells us, tells us that whom God has taken in his hand, nothing in all of creation can shake loose. Thank you for that. I'm going to say that again because this is something that should give you great confidence. Whom God has taken in his hand, nothing in all of creation. So what does all of creation consist of? Everything that's not God. <clears throat> Including you. Excuse me. <clears throat> You know, Sunday's the only day that I get frogs in my throat. <laughs> so, can we drift away from salvation? I do not believe you can drift away. However, however, you need to understand what salvation is. Okay? What does it take to be saved? Romans tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Okay? We have to confess... We have to believe. Ephesians takes that formula and it breaks it down even further. It, it breaks it down to the root of all things and that's our equation. What is our equation for salvation? What do we start with? Grace. Grace. Grace, grace comes first. Because you can believe all you want, but without grace you're still host. You're still in trouble. Okay? So grace comes first. first. Grace plus faith, faith equals salvation. unto works. Works does not get you saved. Only the grace of God and the faith that He builds in you, that He gives you, can bring you to salvation. But there are two things that we don't ever talk about in salvation that Jesus spoke of throughout His earthly ministry that the other writers of the New Testament reiterate time after time. Okay, The works that comes out of our salvation, there are two things that we need to note as to true salvation. Because there's a lot of posers. There's a lot of people walking around thinking, hey, man, I am okay with God. I prayed that prayer. I asked Him into my heart. He's, he's, I'm, I'm good, man. Well, hmm. There's two other things that we have to be aware of. Because, see, many will come to Him on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not so much how well you know God, it's whether or not He knows you. Okay? So, there are two things in Scripture. <clears throat> that Jesus says, and the, the New Testament writers reiterate. The first is that when you come to salvation, when you go to the cross, all of a sudden you're going to start seeing those things that separate you from God, those things that, that, that make you profane and, and 
make him holy, you're going to start seeing those profane things start to fall away. You're going to, to see all of a sudden that, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay? Now, this is not an external thing because that's the law. Okay? Read the book of Galatians. It, it talks all about trying to have an external faith. Okay? If I just keep all of these things, then I'll be okay with God. If you could do that, we wouldn't need the cross. Okay? So, so the fact that we have the cross lets you know right there you can't do it. Sorry, folks. That's actually a good thing. Because, because we couldn't do it, God sent His Son, and, and now we're inheritors of grace. Okay? But the first thing is that you will find that your desires are going to begin to merge with God's will. And in some areas, you're going to see this instantaneous leap where you went from here, pshoom, bow, over here. I know several men, several men, that were caught up in, in drug addictions. And I'm talking hardcore drug addictions. And when they came to salvation, pshoom, thunk, those drug addictions just went away. Two of them, two of the men that I know, could not give up smoking. Oh my gosh, they smoke and they're Christians. <sighs> Look, Scripture says that we um, have self-control. Okay, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control. And I've seen so many people that are overweight and gluttons pointing the finger at people that smoke. Hey, look, it says self-control. If you can't put down that second piece of pie, guess what? You're lacking self-control. Okay, so... <clears throat> As we come into Him, as we grow, as we mature, we're going to start seeing these things that God rejects. That God has no part of. We're going to start seeing these things start to fall away. And, and God's going to and thank God He doesn't reveal them all to us at once. We just all melt into a puddle of goo. Okay? Again, that speaks to the magnificence of His grace. But he takes those things and he starts weeding them out. That's what the Holy Spirit was sent to do, to convict the world of sin, right? And, and that conviction is, is that, that all of a sudden that realization that this is wrong. I, I can't do this. I shouldn't be doing this. And, and how do I make this right? And then that spirit births in you an ability to start saying no. Now, sometimes it's an instantaneous process. Sometimes you've got to work through it. Sometimes you've got to. You gotta, see, there's, there's a, a cooperative effort going on here. There is the Holy Spirit that does the, does the majority of the work, and then there's you that has to agree with it. Galatians chapter 5 talks about wrestling with our flesh. That we would choose to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. So even though the Spirit is in us, you know, He expects us to, to get our, our, our hands dirty in this process. He wants us involved, and when that... that that temptation rises up in front of you. He expects you to say no. There's so many times, man, we stumble and we start blaming God. Oh God, you didn't deliver me of this. Just say no. That's like a new slogan. Just say no. <laughs> okay? So the first thing is, after salvation, you're going to see the fruit of the Spirit start to be birthed in your life, you're going to start seeing the shedding away of the unrighteous acts, the unrighteous thinking. Okay? That is one clear indication of salvation. That's one. There's another. There's another. So actually, I'm going to give you a couple scriptures as far as um, obey, obeying Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 11 verse 28 says, But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 15, 14 says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Romans 1, 5, Paul writes, he says, Through whom, through whom is speaking of Jesus, uh, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among the nations. Catch what he's saying there. We have received grace 
This is to bring about obedience. Okay? Um, second thing. Jesus makes this very clear in Matthew 24, 13. First, we have grace, and then faith unto salvation, or equal salvation, and then unto works. Part of that work that is coming out is that we're going to become obedient to the will of God. The other thing is endure. Jesus says that the one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay? Because remember the parable of the sower of the seed? It all started out looking the same. It was all the same kind of seed. And he cast that seed out. Some landed on the, the path. And the birds came and took it up. Some landed among the rock. And it had no root. So when it grew up, the sun came and it scorched it and it withered. Some fell among the weeds. And it grew up among the weeds, and yet the weeds choked it out, and it died. And then there was a seed that grew up in the good soil, and it produced a crop, a multitude beyond itself. Which of those seeds inherited the kingdom of God? Because see, it was all the same seed. The first seed, they had no understanding. The first seed had no understanding. The second seed had no root. The third seed had idols. Remember what it says? The cares and the concerns of this life and the desire for wealth. Jesus made it very clear, you cannot serve two gods. And he spoke in reference to what other god? Money, mammon, material possessions, stuff. So the seed that was planted in good soil, it has understanding, it endures, it has root, it celebrates and cherishes only one Lord in its life. And then beyond the other three, it reproduces after its own kind. So let's get back to the questions with this understanding. Is it possible to make a profession of faith in Christ and not be in it? Yes. We say a lot of things that we don't mean. We say a lot of things in, in the moment that have no endurance. They do not endure for a period of, of, of infinity. So can people make a profession of faith and not be saved? You betcha. Okay? The, the, the profession of faith isn't all. Because it says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Okay? So can I drift away from it? Yeah, if you were never in it, you can drift away from it. You come close to the light and turn around and move away from the light and come close to the light and move away from the light and you come close to the light and move away from the light. Yeah, if you are not in it, you can drift away. If you are in it, you may stumble. James says we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. But the righteous man gets back to his feet. Do I test myself by seeing if Christ Jesus is in me? Yep. Yep. How do we know? What's the measure whereby we, we test ourselves? Yeah. First we measure it according to Jesus Christ, but how do we know what He is? Right here, folks. you got to know this. This has got to be knitted into your thinking, into your soul, such that when something comes against you, you have a solid rock to stand on. You have a solid point to argue from. You have a place where you can firmly establish yourself and not be moved. Okay? So do I test myself? 
You betcha. What do I test myself with? You, you, your measure is Jesus Christ. My measure is not you folks. Your measure is not me. It's not your spouse. It's not your parents. It's not your children. It's not your friends. It's Jesus Christ and Him alone. Who being tempted in every way did not sin. See, man, I can pick people left and right that I can hold myself up to and go, <laughs> I'm in a good place, God. Because I ain't where they are. I can also pick a bunch of people that I can go, oh God, I'm never going to be where they are. But that's not the measure, folks. The measure is Jesus Christ. And the, the revelation that we have of Him is through His Word. So, if I fail, what do I do? If you fail the test, what do you do? You've got to find where you failed. You've got to find where you failed. Because there's, there's all kinds of reasons people can fail. Some people just don't understand. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us that, that those uh, unbelievers, they're not going to be able to understand His Word. They're not going to be able to understand. How do we ever get understanding? It's only through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one that teaches us. It reminds us of all things. Okay? There, you, there are people that have no endurance. They have no root. There are people that have other concerns that are more important than God. And we, we would, I mean, I venture to guess, man, if I gave you guys a piece of paper and had you write down your list of priorities, the majority of you at the top of that list would be God. And yet, if you were to look at your life and examine your life and, and your devotion and the time you spend pursuing anything on that list, I guarantee you that that number one priority would, would realistically be down significantly further in that list. We're all guilty of it, folks. Okay? I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. There are days where uh, I'll get off doing something, I get busy, and I'll go for hours and, and not have a single thought about God. And then all of a sudden it's like, where has my head been? What, what was so important and valuable in that time that I couldn't concentrate, that I couldn't sing His praise, that I couldn't lift up somebody or something in prayer? Man, I, I can pray while I'm working. How often should I do this? Always. Test yourself always. Check. Make sure you're lining up with the Word of God. Make sure your life is, is where it's supposed to be. Don't be afraid of it. I mean, if, if the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, He's not going to reveal something to you to leave you hanging. He, he's revealing it to you because He wants to walk you through it and get you out the other side. What about backsliding? <clears throat> what about it? All of us stumble. Okay? And, and, and the difference here, I want to make clear there's a very big difference here. Because there are those that, that call backsliding, okay, you know, you, you, uh, when we lived in Houston, there was a period of about four years where I wanted absolutely nothing to do with church. Because the church that we were at here in Montana, it was such a, a horrific experience, it, it, it really burned me. And, and God showed me that I, I was placing my faith in the church and not in Him. Okay? But, but I went through a period of about four years where I, I wanted nothing. I told, I told Christy, don't call me a Christian because I don't want to be associated with those people. And I was mad. I was bitter. And yet, a year after we moved back to Montana, God puts us in this church here. And now I, I went to church, you know, during that time. I had my notebook, and in my notebook I would jot down everything that the entire service did that was wrong. <laughs> oh, they, they messed up the rhythm on this song. They got the lyrics wrong. <laughs> Pastor misused that quote. That is not what that passage means. Why does the dude stand in front of his podium? Man, how unprofessional is that? <laughs> And I, I made those notes when I came to this church. Come in the back door so Mary Lou doesn't see you. <laughs> but she will catch you at the front door and hug you. <laughs> okay, look folks, I got a huge bubble. Alright? 
And, and once you're inside the bubble, we're okay with physical contact. You got a big bubble too, baby. <laughs> but man, if you're not in my circle, don't touch me. My family used to think it was so funny. They would make me sit on the open end of the table at a restaurant because everywhere we went, the waiter or waitress would come up and they'd do this. So what are we having today? <laughs> I'm having a whole lot of don't touch me. <laughs> but God changed me and Mary Lou worked her way into my bubble. <laughs> She was insistent. <laughs> okay? And, and I made that list, and, and Christy and I... Now, I'm not, I'm not alone in this, because Christy and I would discuss the list. And she would add parenthetical statements. And sometimes she would strike things out and say, yeah, no, that was he, was... he was actually pretty right on with this one. However, the next one, he totally screwed up. <laughs> and we had this list, and, and, and so... We had our list and we take it to God and say, hey God, you know, when you can find a church that gets all this right, let me know. And God told me, nah, I'm not going to let you know because you're going to go and screw it up. <laughs> and we were praying one day and, and, and we were really starting to seek God. He was drawing me out of that bitterness. And God told me, he said, okay, you, you see the list that you've been making over the past few months? Oh yeah, God. Got to get working on those, man. You're a busy man. You're a busy God. You got to get busy. He said, I want you and Christy to get involved and help fix them. <laughs> oh God, why was I so picky? <laughs> this is okay. We can, we can deal with this. This is all right the way that it is. So God really turned me around and started bringing the, the, the first thing that God restored to me was the sweetness of fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And that was huge. That was huge. The, the next thing that he restored to me is that the, the worship service, even though we are worshiping corporately, we worship as individuals. And no matter what is going on around me, if, if, if David is throwing a fit, if, if one of my grandchildren up in the front is doing something, if one of you is sneezing or coughing or, or one of you is do, gets up to go use a restroom, I, those are not things that I can afford to be distracted by. Because when I come to worship God, I want to worship God because He's worthy. I don't want to be distracted by stuff going on around me. You know? Man, if I, if I want to raise my arms and surrender to God, I don't want to be inhibited by any of you people that aren't. Amen. If I want to keep my head bowed and not raise my arms, I don't want to be pressured into raising them. I just want to worship. I want to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And, and the truth is that on any given Sunday, this morning, the place that I am at this morning is probably very different than the place all of y'all are. Because we've got different lives. Okay? So, uh, am I backsliding? Yeah, I, I believe there's a period of time, and, and oftentimes several periods of time, where we just we go through a tough time. And God is working things out in us. He is, he is showing us that we can trust Him. And it feels like we've been abandoned. We've been bereft. He, he's just left us alone to face this mess. What does Scripture tell us He's doing in that moment? He's testing our faith. So that we can see that it is a greater value than pure gold. That's what He's doing. He's building us. He's working. Do you ever, you ever go through a tough time? What's the first thing you do when you go through a tough time? You run away from God? What is the thing we're supposed to do when we're going through a tough time? We're, going, we're supposed to run to him. I still get it wrong. I still get it wrong. Something happens, and instead of getting on my knees in prayer, I pout. <laughs> <laughs> and my prayers change from God help me to God get them. <laughs> God wants us to come to Him. He tells us to take our burdens, to cast our cares on Him. That we would be yoked with Christ because His yoke, His burden is easy and it's light because He does all the work. So, am I backsliding? Possibly. Uh, what happens if I die while in this state? Well, you know what? <clears throat> this is why... I am so taken, I'm so amazed 
at God's grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because when Jesus went to the Christ, to the cross, he died once for all. Yeah. All sin. Past, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Present, to all the stupid stuff I do right now. Future, all the stuff that's going to go till he comes back again. It's all covered. And yet, he asks of us that we would accept him as Lord. Now, now the thing that is amazing about this is right now we have the, the freedom to accept what he has done, to receive the gift of grace, to receive his mercy. But that doesn't change the fact whether we receive it or whether we don't. doesn't change the fact that He's Lord. He's Lord because it's all His. You know? Everything in creation is His. So He's the boss. Now whether you acknowledge it now or not, one day you will. Because it says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? So uh, what happens if I die in this state? Uh, having stumbled, um, I was dependent on His grace when He saved me. I'm dependent on His grace now. I'm dependent on His grace when I'm high. I'm dependent on His grace when I'm low. I'm dependent on His grace when I have a lot. I'm dependent on His grace when I have a little. Amen. There's no point when I'm not dependent on His grace because His grace covers all my sin. Okay? Amen. All right. That went a little bit longer than I was thinking. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Mark. <clears throat> we have been working through discipleship. <clears throat> uh, this week we're going to wrap up. I need to apologize. Um, some of the information I got on these, these three positions I received off an article on the internet and I had originally taken the entire article that had the reference of the person that wrote it, and it was, it was from a Bible college. And I was going to share that with you, but in the process of cutting and pasting notes and making my notes and adjusting things and removing things, somewhere I lost the reference, and I can't find it. So the, the, the point of the three points, the, the call, the demand, the grace, and the promise, these are, are points that were in a, a scholarly paper that I found online, and then I've taken those positions and, and I've expanded on them. Okay, so, so I apologize to whoever wrote the paper. I can't find your thing to give you credit, but God knows and God bless you. Okay, so we've been talking about discipleship. We talked about the unique place that Jesus had as a rabbi and the way that he did things being completely different than what was expected. He went out and called disciples to him rather than sitting and waiting for parents to bring their children to him to be discipled. Uh, one of the things that absolutely amazes me, it, it, it kind of flabbergasts me. Do you guys know that word flabbergast? <laughs> Has anybody else heard that word flabbergast? Okay, whew. nobody responded. Uh, every movie that I've ever seen, with the exception of one, that talks about the ministry of Jesus and his disciples, they always have older men in the group. I mean, um, how many of you have seen Risen? Fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, go go rent it. Take a look at it. It's, it's the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection told from the perspective of a, a Roman tribune, a non-believer. And he's tasked with finding out what happened. Okay, it's a fantastic story. But, but invariably, Peter's always an old dude. He couldn't have lived as long as he did if he was that old when they started. He couldn't have gotten from where he was to where God sent him if he was that old at that point in time. They, these men were younger, most likely younger, and possibly significantly younger than Jesus. Okay? Very unlikely that they would be older than him. In that culture, even in somewhat in our culture, they would have a hard time submitting to his lordship, to his, his headship. Okay? So, Jesus goes out and he calls these disciples, and, and then he makes of 12 of them, he makes them apostles. But I mean, think about this. James and John, they're still on the fishing boat with Dad. Okay? So they couldn't have been that old. And then they take off and leave Dad with all the work to do. <laughs> 
So, Jesus calls disciples to himself. He's still calling disciples to himself. His voice still goes out in the world today by the Holy Spirit, by the profession of the faith of the church. That's, that's you and me, folks. And he is still drawing people to him. So we looked at three components uh, of this call. Uh, the first one is the demand. And this is the fact that when Jesus calls you, he calls you to come to the cross. Okay? That's the gateway, the cross. He says that if any would follow me, he must take up his cross, Luke says, daily. Every day, take up your cross. Take up the cross. Paul says that, that when we come to him, we come to die. Because that process of, of, of baptism is, is of death, burial, and resurrection into new life. We are a new creation. We're new. Okay? And that process, the demand, when you come to Jesus, it's all or nothing, baby. You can't bring anything with you. What do you have of any worth to offer Him that, that's worth keeping in light of everything that He wants to give you? See, that's where faith comes in. Because if you're looking at, at, at the material things, you're going, okay, well... Right now, I have this, that, and the other. And if I come to him, i got to give all those up for what? Well, he promises that if you follow him, you're going to face hardship. You're going to face persecution. You will, may very well face death because of your faith in him. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Oh, no. Oh, no. Because when we come to Him, He reserves a place for us in the eternity where those material things that you think are so important, yeah, He paves the streets with gold. That's, that's what He sees the value as. That's what He sees. He gives to you crowns, a reward for your service. And then when we see Him, when we come to that place where we see Him, and we see how awesome He is, we take those clown, crowns and we lay them at His feet. The demand is your life. It's everything, folks. Everything is laid down before Him. Now some things He's going to take, He's going to give right back to you. But He's going to give them to you with a different understanding of how they're to be used. Some things He's just going to take away. Say, no, you don't, know, you don't need these. These are a distraction. These are a hindrance. Remember the rich young ruler came riding up to Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him the, the list of the Mosaic Law. And he said, well, I've done all of these. Since I was a child, I've, I've kept all of these. And, and Jesus looked at him and he saw in his heart because this, this young man had much. He was wealthy. And he saw that those things were a hindrance to him. And he said, one thing you lack. Take all that you possess. Sell it and give to the poor. And then come follow me. And that rich young ruler rode away sad because he, he couldn't let go of his stuff. Stuff. Okay? So the first thing of this call, we have to understand it's a demand. It's all or nothing. Okay? The second thing is grace. He has promised us that in the midst of this, He will be with us. He has said that this is not an empty-ended thing. It's not like we're giving up everything and we just have nothing. He has promised us that there is an end to this race. And that when we get to the end of this race, we will receive a reward. He promises us that He would not leave us, nor forsake us. He promises that He would send His Spirit, the Spirit of God, to come. To be our comforter. To teach us, to remind us, to convict us. To empower us. But then there's 
the promise. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 10. Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10. <laughs> We're right at the end of the story of the rich young ruler. <clears throat> um, I'm going to pick up, uh, well, we'll start in verse 23, but I want to focus on a little bit later. Um, the young man has ridden away. Uh, he was sorrowful. Verse 23, it says, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, What, the, what in the world does exceedingly astonished look like? <laughs> I mean, they were astonished. Whoa. Exceedingly astonished. Whoa! I mean, what does that even look like? When, when, when Mark wrote this down, we believe that Mark received this from Peter. So Peter would have been the eyewitness to this. Something was significantly different from the first to the second. Okay? They were exceedingly astonished. And said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Thank you, Father. That all things are possible with Him. Peter began to say to Him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is not one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Okay, so, so look at what he's, he's talking about here. Okay, because the, the whole emphasis here is on the material things that distract us that would keep us from heaven. Okay, and so what, what Jesus is talking about are those physical things. He's talking about family and stuff. Okay? Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands I'm going to pause right there for a second because this is where most people like to stop. Okay? And, and I've heard teachers actually teach on this. The, the, you know, oh, you send me $10 and God will send you a thousand. Right, so sorry, folks, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that because if they really believed it, they'd be sending me the $10. Okay? Because if they really believe that God was going to multiply it to them, they'd be getting, man, they'd be shelling it out as fast as they could. I don't believe that he's talking about those material things, those possessions that you will have. I think what he's talking about is the dynamic way that he's going to put the church together. Because you look at it, wherever they went, there were people that would take them in. When, when Paul is writing his letters, as far as Paul is concerned, he's writing to his family. Houses brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land with persecutions. Uh-oh. Wow, we just took a hard left turn, didn't we? All right, we're getting jumped. Yeah. I got to get me some sisters. <laughs> Did he just say persecution? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Because I can see Peter. I love Peter. Because man, the, the dude is real. You know, I, I love the fact that when he doesn't understand something, he goes, could you, could you 
explain that like in simpleton terms because I don't understand what you're saying. And if it weren't for Peter, Jesus wouldn't have explained things in another way so you and I could understand. Okay? It says, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Okay? See, here's the promise. When you come to Him and you lay these things down, and you surrender to Him whatsoever He would have of you. Give it up. And you can, in your heart, you can willingly let go whatever it is. He promises you that you will never be alone in the midst of what you're going to be facing. He promises that even should your biological family forsake you, he is going to put brothers and sisters around you. In, in the Old Testament it says that God sets the lonely in families. And, and that's, see, that's why it's so important that the church body functions the way that it should. Because we are one family that God has knit and is knitting together. Okay. So when, when I'm in need, you can help me. And when you're in need, I can help you. That, that we look out for one another. That we uphold one another. That we intercede in prayer for one another. And the promise is that you will receive all these things, but you're going to receive them with the right attitude that it's all God's and I'm a steward of it. And I want to use it for His glory and for, for His the promotion of Christ, not the promotion of Glenn. And persecution. Uh-oh. And persecution. See, this is going right back to the demand. Because the world hates God. The world hates Jesus. And if you are a true follower of Jesus, the world is going to hate you. Scripture says that friendship with the world is enmity to God. So you got to choose. Which side of the fence are you going to be on? See, so you're either going to be with the world and you will be an enemy of God. Or you're going to come over onto His side. Coming through the cross, receiving and being an inheritor of His grace and His mercy. Which will make you an enemy of the world. Okay? With persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, there's something I want to share with you about eternal life real quick. And I'm going to wrap up. Eternal life doesn't just mean that you exist forever. Okay? The, the idea behind the concept of eternal life is that it's an eternity of good life. It's not an eternity where, you, you know, <clears throat> when I was a kid, <clears throat> and they would teach us in Sunday school, because I went to Sunday school for a long time before I ever got saved, and they would talk about heaven and playing harps and sitting on clouds. Man, I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't want to go to hell with pitchforks and fire either. But man, isn't there somewhere I can stand on solid ground and not have to play an instrument? Yeah. You know? Isn't there something I can do up there? See, God has a perfect plan for you, not just in this life, but in eternity. And I believe absolutely that you are going to be so fulfilled with what God gives you to do in heaven that this, even the best moment in this earth is going to fade away to obscurity. I don't like to be bored. My poor wife, she loves, she calls them veg days. I hate them. I hate them. She, she would, man, she, if she could have the time to just sit in her chair and stare off into the valley and ponder and, and just not do much of anything, that to her would be a great day for all of about seven minutes until I got bored. <laughs> And then I'd be like, sweetie, 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 I'm bored. <laughs> sweetie, let's do something. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. I just don't want to sit here doing nothing. <laughs> That's why I'm so convinced that when I get to heaven, God's going to have a list of things for me to do. He's going to keep me busy. Because he created me this way. He created me to not want idle time. I, I want to be doing something. That's, that's part of why I love these Ask the Pastor questions. Because they challenge me. 
They get me into the Word and start digging and researching and, 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 and gives me focus for something to do so Christy can sit and not have me bother her. See, you're really helping her out, folks. Okay? But I am absolutely convinced that the, the eternal life is something that is going to be so satisfying to you, so fulfilling, so rich. Now why would we want anything else? Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you this morning because you have promised us in your word that, Father, your, your life, the life that you give us is so worth it. That, Father, those things that you have promised us, that you are faithful to do, God, it's so worth it. I ask, Father, today that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that you would reveal to us those places where we have locked you out, where we have denied you access, those places that, that we want to keep secure and keep hidden. Father, that you would give us the courage, the boldness to open those up, that you would root those out, Father, that, that you might bring healing, that, Father, you might bring forgiveness, that you might bring restoration. Father, that you would make us into what you have called us to be, not what we were, not even a better model of what we were, but, Father, the, the very image of Christ Jesus. I ask, Lord God, if there would be any here today that don't know you, that have not surrendered their life, that today would be the day of their salvation. That you would speak to them, that you would draw them, Father, that their ears would be hope, open to hear, their hearts ready to receive. I ask, Father, for those of us that, that have already embraced all that you give us, Father, that you would give us boldness to do those things that you have called us to do. Father, that you would set a fire in our bones. That we would hunger and thirst for you. That we would find our satisfaction in you. And we bless you for your word. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.